Hey folks, so I'm going to use this video to wrap up our discussion on momentum um, and see what happens when an object's momentum doesn't necessarily stay the same, so moving beyond just collisions between a couple of objects. Um, but before we do that, let's talk two-dimensional collisions. Believe it or not, sometimes collisions don't just happen in one dimension. We've done a bunch of examples where things are maybe heading toward each other or maybe one thing is heading toward another and just hits it and they both move off in a certain direction. Um, but we've not necessarily done an example of, let's say I'm moving to the right and I get hit by something moving upward or something like that. Um, that's where collisions in two dimensions comes into it. So momentum is a vector. So that just means that each component, the x component of the original momentum and the y component of the original momentum, both of those are conserved. So when you're solving these problems, basically ask yourself, what is the initial momentum of the entire system? So let's say I have two objects colliding again. What's the initial momentum of the entire system just in the x direction? And what's the momentum of the entire system just in the y direction? So you'll have to brush up once again on good old SOHCAHTOA in order to figure out um, that answer. So again, the total momentum is mass times velocity. So the momentum in the x direction would be mass times velocity times either cosine of theta or sine of theta, depending on whether the x component is adjacent or opposite the angle that you're dealing with. Same deal with the y component. PY would be mass times velocity times the sine of theta or the cosine of theta, again, depending on whether it's adjacent or uh, opposite of that angle theta. So break it down that way. Find a value in kilogram meters per second of PY and of PX. After that, take a step back and think, okay, what objects are going to be moving after the collision? Um, so what would an expression for the final x momentum be? Well, it's basically just going to be um, the x momentum of object 1 plus the x momentum of object 2 plus the x momentum of object 3 plus however many you have. Same deal with the y direction. X, y, direction uh, y momentum of object 1 whew, plus y momentum of object 2 plus so on and so forth. So, you'll take your x momentum value only, set it equal to the final x momentum. So the total sum of each individual object's x momentum before the collision will equal the total sum of each individual object's x momentum after the collision. Same deal in the y direction. So, when I'm going through these two-dimensional problems, I usually divide my sheet into two, have an X section and a Y section. And in each of these, treat it like their own conservation of momentum problem, but only look in that specific direction. So P initial X equals P final X, P initial Y equals P final Y. So once you've solved for the final momentum, Honestly, most of the problems are going to ask you for the final velocity and in what direction. So if I've got the final momentum in the x direction, it's just going to be the mass of the object traveling in the x direction times its velocity in the x direction. Same deal in the y. So once you've gotten those final values, then you can Pythagorean theorem that mess to get its total velocity. Not only that, you can figure out what the angle is going to be just based on SOHCAHTOA. So let's say I've got a final momentum um, pointing leftward in the x direction, and I've got a final momentum pointing upward in the y direction. I'll stack them just like vector addition, which you've done with forces, which you've done with velocities, which you've done with accelerations. Whew. Put them together, Pythagorean theorem it out, and you'll get the final momentum. It'll be the mass times the total velocity of that object. You can solve for velocity that way. 
you can also solve for any angle theta within that triangle that you've made. And that'll tell you which direction that it's heading. Okay. Now, once again, elastic and inelastic collisions come into play here. For elastic collisions, whether it's one dimension or two dimension, the initial kinetic energy of each and every object added together will equal the final kinetic energy of each and every object added together um, for elastic only. Now, for... Uh, oh, and not only that, the initial momentum before and after is the same for these elastic collisions. Now, for inelastic, you can only use conservation of momentum. Cool. But that's what's happening when the total momentum stays the same, when you're just looking at discrete objects that can bounce off of each other. Both objects are movable, and that is that. What if you've got some sort of outside force coming in and messing with things? Um, for example, right now I am looking at uh, a dry erase marker just sitting on my table. And I can actually reach over, pick it up, and throw it, and look at that, it wasn't moving, now it is moving. So its momentum changed. Right? When that happens, um, it's this idea of, of what's called impulse. So I like to start by talking about an egg toss. You and a friend are taking part in an egg toss competition, and your friend throws it your way. So what strategy are you going to have to catch it? Odds are, you're not just going to run toward it and slam your fist into the egg while trying to catch it, or slam your palm into it and grab it as quickly as you can. Um, that's generally a bad strategy. If you want to test it, don't do it on school grounds. Instead, you have to kind of cradle the egg like it's a little egg baby. Just bring it in, gently move with it, and slowly bring it to a stop. The difference between those two methods of catching it is really just um, how quickly it's stopping. Either way you do it, the momentum of the egg is changing from whatever it was, which is the mass of the egg times the velocity of the egg. It's changing from that to zero. Once you catch it and stop it, it's changing to zero. So the total change in momentum, no matter how you do it, is going to be the same. It'll be the final condition, zero, minus the initial mass times velocity of the egg. Cool. That's going to be the change in momentum. This change in momentum is what's called impulse. A change in an object's momentum. And remember again, anytime anything is changing, it's just the final condition minus the initial condition. Where I ended up versus where I started. That'll get me the total change. Another way to describe impulse is by force times change in time. So the units of this thing are just going to be newtons times seconds. A newton of force times a second. That's actually going to simplify down to just a kilogram meter per second. If you think about what a newton is from F equals ma, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. If I multiply that by time, then one of the second squareds cancel, I get just kilogram meter per second, and look at that, beautiful, it's the same unit as momentum. Nice. So what's really happening here is the change in momentum, again, no matter how you catch the egg, is going to be the same. It goes from mass of egg times velocity of egg to zero. What changes is the amount of time you take to do it. So if I can increase the amount of time of the collision, then I decrease the amount of force that the egg feels while keeping that same total change in momentum the same. So that's the whole idea behind impulse. The more time you can make a collision happen, the less force you're going to feel. It's actually the entire reason why airbags are installed in your car. Um, if there's some sort of a collision, you could have the dashboard stop you, but it's very, very solid. You would feel a very, very big force because your momentum would change 
almost in, uh, instantaneously. But with the airbag, it's designed as kind of a cushion. Um, so as the airbags go off, your momentum changes, but it slowly changes because of that softer surface that you have. Um, so with uh, more time, you end up with less force. That's why it's such an important safety feature in cars. And I want to just take a second to look at impulse and work. So work is just defined as the change in energy of an object. And impulse is just defined as a change in momentum. But it's very, very similar. Now, work is force times distance. Impulse is force times time. But a lot of these are, are very similar ideas. So we'll work a bit with that. We'll do an impulse lab, and I will see you all in class. Take care.